Hi, kia ora koutou. Thank you very much for coming along. Great to see you all here tonight and welcome to our March Writers' Room um, with the wonderful Mark Elberston, Louis Sutherland and Chair tonight, Andrew Bancroft. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Andrew to introduce the guys. Um, but I'd just like to say that I'm really glad to have Andrew with us tonight. He is a writer, director and producer who's made a number of short films. Um, he's directed commercials, he's made documentaries, um, he started in theatre uh, and he's done lots of stuff and he asked me not to go on about it because he wants to get right into it. So, um, but what I am going to say is he started teaching at the Film Academy just up the road. Um, so that's his latest role and um, check it out if you're interested in studying film. Thank you very much. I'll hand over to Andrew. Thank you. Hi all. Um, one thing that I, um, I did uh, was run a Film Commission pod scheme a couple of years, and one of the first films that we financed was Run, which was the first film. Your first film? First film by these guys. That's how I met these guys. That's how I became uh, an admirer of not just the stories that they tell, which are very particular kinds of stories, but also how they make those films. And that's what I'm going to try and share um, a little bit of with you tonight. So um, it's not an easy thing to, um, to, to, to stand up and talk about your baby. So big welcome. Mark Orbison, Louis Sutherland. seen this feature film shopping. Has anybody else seen it? Anybody else seen it? Is anybody um, who hasn't read a synopsis, who, who knows nothing about this feature film shopping? Nothing at all. Okay, that's gonna need um, that's gonna need a lift speech, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> who wants to do it? Do you want me to do it? No. Okay, so I repeat to this a few times. So uh, <laughs> I had to lift myself myself to lift the film. Here we go. Uh, so yeah shopping it's basically, uh, you know, uh, we just to give you a little bit of a prelude to the uh, synopsis is, uh, you know, we we generally uh, make movies that come from our own sort of personal experiences. You know, they sort of roughly depends some of the people, you know, inspired by some of the people we've met and some of the sort of interesting things that have happened to us in our lives. Um, shopping is a story about a boy that's sort of fallen out with his father and falls into the arms of a, of a um, big time sort of petty thief and uh, yeah, the crux of it is that he has to make a big decision between looking after his younger brother and the family and uh, starting a new life because the life that he's in you know, isn't so great so uh, but basically it's a film about a choice between family and the wrong side of the tracks and so uh, yeah that's Shopping. I hope you guys do a better job with your synopsis. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty lousy on doing. It's really awful. It's really beautiful. I have to tell you, it's a very, very beautiful film. Very real. Um, it's also um, the boy is 15, 16, 15, and it's set in the 70. It's set in 1981. 1981. Same, same time as the Spanish War. Oh, yeah, right. Um, so, um, first question: Where did that story come from? Where did the story of this this boy come from? Um, uh, when I was 15, I had uh, a series, well, even before I was 15, I had a, uh, quite a few falling outs with my father. And so I took off from home at some stage, on and off. Uh, Sorry, can everyone hear Louis? Just wanted to check. Sorry. Sorry. Um, just wanted to twist your microphone. We just, thank you. Yeah. Um, just the microphone, just just microphone. Microphone. Is it? Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, the the you know before I was fifteen I sort of had a lot of run-ins with my, my dad. It's quite a common thing, really, isn't it? Especially back then with our generation. I'm sure it still exists today and in the future. But um, I took off from home and, and got hooked up with a, um, a shoplifting gang, which was led by a, a criminal, um, well, a career criminal, and uh, and learned how to shoplift. Um, and uh, at one stage I I got. I got caught um, after a few months on and off, and luckily it was by the local constable who turned up at home and kicked my ass and said, turn it around because you're, you're not a bad prick. 
and you don't want a life like this, so I did. And uh, you know, it's quite lucky because I'd probably be sitting here uh, now. And that's sort of, what, years ago? I think it was about um, 2002 or three. me and Mark, as probably many of you know, we share um, a lot of history together, kind of the same primary school, etc. Um, thought it was a good premise um, for a, a, a feature film idea because it had good stakes and it had good heart. Sorry, um, the, the shoplifting didn't happen in 2002. We, <laughs> we, just made, we just finished our short film, Run, which had gone to Cannes and we were on an aeroplane. Uh, that, <laughs> that was in 2002, that was 2007. 2007, sorry. In yeah. 2007 we were on an aeroplane and, and we had to sort of come up with our, our big grand feature idea that we were going to take off the back of our first short film, mm. Run, which Andrew was the EP on. <coughs> and we were on an aeroplane and we put it down on a, on a, on a serviette, I think. On yeah. It was one of those terrible things where you did it for the wrong reasons, you know, as opposed to feeling really... What, what, what were the reasons? What were the reasons? Well, we were on our way to Cannes and we were told, guys, you got to have something ready. <laughs> you know, and we were like, fuck, we've got 24 hours to write a film. <laughs> and we tried to do it, it was terrible. Um, and then we went over there and pitched it. And it probably sounded really good, but then writing it is another thing we'll be good at. And, uh, and it took us probably a good two or three years to kind of get it back from this uh, sort of you know, bad mistake with the head, but you learn from them. Um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of that's what, that's where long, come from. Okay. long answer to your question. I mean, it's, well, you know, this is a this is a story about you, Louis. That's what I'm hearing. Shopping story about you. It's it's a it's it's a story that was inspired by moments from my past. So when you look at it, do you see do you see your life on screen? Do you see what do you see? Uh, moments. There's moments of it, eh? But then. You know, we, we, we don't kid ourselves, and it's the same with all of our work, you know, from Run to Six or Fifty Man, is it's, 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 it's for an audience and it's, it's for a particular medium, which is film. It's not a documentary, it's a narrative. So, you know, we will shift and change what we need to. Uh, what, we're not, what, what, we're not what, purists. What's hard about there. it being your, your life, you know, using that as your, what's, well, actually, I'll flip it around. What's the advantage? Yeah. Of basing it on something that that, 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 that you know really happened that, that's your life. Uh, well, with well, detail and yeah, I, th I think uh, you know it's interesting having worked with Louis on a personal story of his, or well, that it was generated from a personal story of his, and now I'm writing a, a film that's sort of based on a some per personal moments in my life. But you know I think what it does do is it ch you, you challenge every single central character in the film because you know them. Uh, and challenge, uh, will challenge yourself to, to try and capture them for the screen. So, as we know, you know, like Louis' dad, you know, as we know everyone in our lives, like Louis' dad, who is the antagonist of the film, isn't just a one note sort of character. You know, they've got dimension. And I think that if you know the people that you're, that you're writing in the film, you know, you really stick up for them and make sure that, that that's not the way that they're portrayed. Uh, you know, whereas I think, you know, if you if you're making up a story, for instance, um, particularly when you uh, get sort of interesting script advice and, and, and things like that, you know, it's often kind of I imagine it would be easier to put some of those characters to the sword. You know, if if you hadn't known where they've come from. Uh, so I think that's an advantage, and the, and the disadvantages. I think too, you know, just generally speaking, it gives you a lot of, and th this is a dangerous tightrope to walk, it gives you a lot of heart when you're creating. It's not just an idea thin from the year, and there's nothing wrong with them, but when you are working, there's a spirit in the room and on the page, and, <clears throat> and sometimes that can blind you, you know, so you have to watch that, because you can't be, at the same time, you're sharing it with people. Can, can you give process. us an example of, of, of blinding? Uh, blinding well, blind? well um, probably more just more adapting, you know, like like with shopping without giving too much away. You know, I, it was sheer sure, you know, inspired by my father, but it's not my father, you know. My father was far scarier. <laughs> but he's also far more intelligent, and he had a lot more charisma, he had a lot more dimension than we had the time for uh, to, to reveal and share with an audience in shopping. That's really fucking hard because you suddenly go, God, you know, you know, at points. You go, wow, what are we doing? And I'd say the same with the, the figure of mum. But that's where you go, but we're making the film. You know, this is not really, as you say, it's not really about me. 
you know, it's giving, it's, it's sharing something, it's heartfelt, it's sharing something that's from our culture, but, but it's, it's letting the audience come to and make their own decisions and not smashing them in the head with anything I live. You know? Has your dad seen it? No, no, he hasn't yet. Uh, but he's seen one, you know, which, which is kind of like, well, always, well we, we sort of like him. Shopping's like run growing up, um, although the coverage and is, is very different in the pace. Um, and the one Mark's writing now is, uh, which is called House Teeth, is, is the $6.50 man kind of growing up. Um, when my father saw Run, it, was, it took some time before I had kind of, the, I guess, the guts to show him and my mum. And my mum just sort of sat there and was like, oh yeah, it was after Sunday dinner. And she was busy digesting and she was quite happy. And but my dad went, that's about me. And I sat there and looked at him and I took a minute to think about it and I went, no, 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 that's about me. And so, you know, there was this real kind of, and he kind of, he, he accepted that and, you know, we've had a chat about it without him having said it yet. And he's, uh, he knows what I do and he's very happy about it. Yeah, I think, uh, well, I'm starting off with the journey with this next one, we're just writing a synopsis for early development for the film commission. Um, so, I've written a rough script, but very much like Louis, you know, I'm, I'm, my mum's in there. What, what, is, he, what is the attitude of your family to, to this? We both have family members that we talk about quite a lot uh, when we start writing, and, and for us they're very important parts of the process, but we'll sit down and we'll just have a chat about shit that's happened. Mm. It's often, it's amazing how things like that sort of end up in the script, but, so with my son Jude, uh, everyone that has met Jude doesn't really forget Jude. Uh, <laughs> he's quite full on, but what I've noticed, you know, when you do have kids, and I think that's the advantage of being a, a father telling kids stories, is that, um, you know, like in the $6.50 man, he is really, un he does really, really unusual things that don't necessarily connect to the problem. You know, kids, when they have problems, they make you look over here and not at the, at the problem because the problem, you know, they're trying to hide. But there's a release valve somewhere, you know, and, and that's that's what we did with uh, Six Dollar Fifty Man. You know, Andy kind of read, so you know, he was kind of had a short fuse and was kind of aggressive with other kids, for instance. And um, yeah, so all the, it's not always quite as specific, I suppose, as, as shopping. Yeah, and I just have a general <coughs> response to that whenever I've asked that we are. It's like, you know, well, you know, what makes these films relative and a lot of people, it's, and tragically a lot of people uh, understand them is that, you know, um, that it, it reaches people because they've experienced aspects of the story. Um, so right there and then, um, and that's internationally, that's all over the place, we get people coming up all the time, you know. When you, cultures. when you make, when you're writing it, do you have a did you have somebody in mind that in, as a, as as an audience member, you know, that you were making it for? No, not really. No, it's, it's funny uh, we don't well with with shopping because I pinned that, even though we write together. Um, it was more kind of following the the, the I don't know. Well, that's only to um, the theory, but you know, it's sort of. Following the script, really finding it, um, and that's probably why it took six years to write. But, <laughs> you know, we listen to the script, and, and somehow doing that, and between ourselves, we're doing it. Uh, we, we find a way. You know, we, we understand. So you know, writing one hundred and one, but because um, that's easy, it's 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 um, it's it's trying to let the script kind of. Well, I've heard this before. Write itself. You know, and, and there is that, there is that. I mean, you're, you're pushing the pen and stuff, but you're kind of finding stuff and you're listening at the same time. And those scene is, is individual to the prior or the latter, you know, they, they all kind of talk to each other and speak to each other when you get, particularly when you get later in the, in the drafts, you know. Um, so it's more about listening to that and, and your instincts, uh, you know. Um, it's not like page talks, so that's called madness. Um, it's, it's your instincts and your feelings, you know, as you, as you turn the page. And, as you go through it. So, so yeah, just to, just to talk to that too, I suppose, you know, like the difference in our two short films probably describes 
that in a really sort of succinct way is that, you know, like with shopping, uh, originally, you know, we spent some time together uh, trying to write a film that was, you know, a long time before we started on shopping, that was just rubbish. You know, we read it and we spent this is posh, you know. Neither of us were inspired. We started talking about sort of things that started happening to us and I went, hang on a minute, you know, Louis, that, you know, that story is really interesting, you know. And we talked to someone that was, you know, Hone Koka that was, uh, had a, had a script group down in, um, down in Wellington called Writer's Block. And, he, and we said, look, we've got an idea for this film, what do you reckon? And he goes, look, just, doesn't, you don't have to write the script, just write some stuff down, bring some scenes in, and we'll, we'll talk to the, you know, and, and, and read them to the group. Uh, and so we picked out moments from Louis' life, but it wasn't, there was no narrative. They were just scenes. Uh, and we read them out to the group, and some of the group were nearly in tears as we wrote, uh, read them out. Louis could have read them because... Really uh, <laughs> it's okay, just, uh, so Louis was there, he was in a really uh, hard place because um, you know, some of the material was quite close, but then he was also listening to me read it, and I'm not very good. So, uh, <coughs> but we got a really good reaction, and what, so what, the way that that film came together was that we sort of uh, pieced together moments, and sort of tried bits here and there, and it worked into a narrative. Whereas, uh, in, the, in the Six Dollar Fifty Man, I told Louis a story, I said, oh, I think I've got an idea for our next film, it's based on a day that I ran away from school, you know? Uh, I went to school, I, went, you know, I kicked the ball onto the roof, I wasn't allowed to go there, you know, like, I jumped up on the roof, it was a girl's ball, you know, so I got it down for her, this was after school, and, out there, and a teacher marched me to the headmaster's office, and uh, I ended up, while well, she said wait outside his door, I ran off, and then the next day, because I was shit scared of the headmaster, who was a lot like the guy in the film, uh, you know, he, he did smoke a lot. <laughs> but anyway, the next day I arrived back at school and this, and this teacher called me out of my classroom, I went to her classroom and stood me up on a desk and then got two of the biggest kids in class to march me to the headmaster's office. <laughs> and uh, one of them went inside and my friend now, Scott Dre, uh, sort of was waiting outside and I sort of did the, hey Scott, what's that over there? And ran <laughs> across the backfield. And, and our backfield at school had all of these classrooms lined along it and uh, all of the kids rushed to the, to the windows and uh, were basically cheering me on as this kid was sort of chasing me down. He was a lot faster and bigger than me and I was a bit of a wimp anyway, but anyway, and then, and then uh, the next kids sort of joined him and then the teacher came out and they were all sort of, one of them sat on me, you know, the other one sort of hit my arm and then the teacher sort of dragged me out to the headmaster's office. I went to the headmaster's office and he goes, oh, here you've been a bit of a naughty boy. And I said, yeah, and he, and he got me to draw some pictures and gave me happy stamps and that was kind of it. But <laughs> <laughs> it, had, it had a sort of, you know, you can see it's got a structure to it. Uh, you know, and our job with that, with that film was to, you know, um, give it more weight. And so it was later on in the process of writing the film that the boy became dyslexic. Uh, sort of based, and that was sort of based on things that I'd seen, uh, you know, in my son. He wasn't dyslexic, but he had, he had, had kind of other issues, and we thought that was interesting. I'm just going to um, move, it, move it from the personal, you see, it's a very personal process the way these guys work, right? But you've got to bring other people into it. You know, and what happens there when I work with you? I, you know, I've got a particular way of working as an EP. I'm quite script focused, and I found you guys really great to work with because you were very clear in your own mind, um, and therefore you were open to what I had to say. If it didn't work for the story, then it wasn't any big deal. But what happens at feature length? There's a, there's more pressure. There's more money at stake. It's, it's a bigger deal. What uh, what's been your experience of, of um, I guess the f first people coming in be the be script, script consultants, script editors, script analysts. How was the experience? Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, it's a, it's an interesting um, process, particularly for us because there's two of us in the room already, um, and then we have our producer, uh, which would be the as producers, and then you have your consultant. Um, I fucking always get worried with the committee. And then you've got New Zealand Film Commission. You know. <laughs> Um, it, it's a bit weird, really. 
for me, just thinking like that, you know, I'm thinking that. It's a bit, what makes it weird? It's a bit, oh, it's fucking six people talking about a page, you know. It's just, <laughs> you know. Um, but, but you, know, you know, I think, you know, I think it, we're working our way through that. We're finding the right way of doing that. And it's taken our first feature to learn that. Okay, I'll turn the question we're, around. We're what, what, how, how do you want to work with a script editor? How do you, how do you guys want to work with a script editor? Well, we kind of perform that ourselves. We kind of do that ourselves. Because there's two? Uh, because there's two and also the way we think is two. You know, where we're quite, you know, Mark's writing a treatment at the moment for House Teeth and I'm quite demanding as he was with me, with shopping. Um, more so than a producer, we have a, a, a more of an acute language than any creative producer could have with either of us. Uh, and we, we, we push each other all the time, what about this, what about that, but the treatment's finished, what about this, though? what about that, I'm not getting that. And, because we have a strong relationship, because we go so far back, I think we kind of perform that role. Uh, so then, the, you know, like with shopping, we have, although <clears throat> I think shopping was a particular thing, because as I mentioned, we started off with a really sloppy synopsis. Then we had um, a script consultant come in, editor, sorry, and that was uh, Stephen Cleary. Um, and I think, by the way, of where we were at, he kind of failed. But it was as much to do with where we were at with our learning of writing and where the script was at. Um, and that was, that was a really hard time for us. I think it was the only time through the writing process that um, I didn't set the time, but I wondered whether we were going to get there, you know. Um, it's, it's such an important... So, so where were you at? You said you failed because of where you guys were at. Yeah, well, how would you yeah, describe that? Well, it was the wrong choice for the, for the stage that we were at. I think, you know, people are useful at different... People can be very useful at different stages, I think, that. You know, I think you said, Andrew, probably now when we, we talked earlier about this, but, uh, you know, Stephen Cleary is quite good. Um, He's a nuts and bolts guy, really. Uh, towards the end of a project, when I think you've kind of had a chance to realise what it is that you're writing. You know, I think Louis and I, you know, Louis was saying earlier that we uh, find the script as we're writing. I've had the luxury of, uh, Bob Louis was penning shopping and I was feeding in like a script, e script editor of writing uh, Hell's Teeth. And that, that treatment seems to have come together in a, in a kind of really health in a healthy way, you know. I think, you know, and I feel I feel really good about writing it at, at the moment. Anyway, should, you know, who knows from here. But um, uh, it just feels it just feels a lot. I don't know. It just feels more right, you know. And I think know when things are happening in the right way than it did in shopping. I guess guess what I'm trying to say before <coughs> is that where shopping was at, we started with the wrong building blocks. So I'm not saying that mistakes are wrong because actually learning is from usually the wrong experience. You know, if you get something right, I generally forget. You know, if me and him have a great idea, it's great, fuck, it's working. We generally forget you had it. Um, and that's, that's a good thing, because, you know, Whereas there's, no, there's no way. Idea, just, that, that's all <laughs> um, But, but with, with shopping, we were, we were in a bad state to start with. You know, we had a sloppy synopsis. The arena of the action was away from where it should have been. Uh, well, his knee. You know, um, you know, I, I think Stephen Cleary is great. He's almost a scientist. You know, he's a real craftsman, but he's nuts and bolts to some degree, and he's not from here. You know, we have a very organic, ex organic experience. Put those three things together, and it was just a car crash waiting to happen. It's no one's fault. And uh, whereas if we'd had Brad Tiet there at that stage, I think we would have found our way back a lot quicker. Did you need anybody at that stage? Uh, I think we did at that stage because that was our first feature film. We've written two treatments with shopping, we've written a synopsis, we've written 20 something plus drafts. We've kind of learned how to tell that formula. It was the same with Run. It took us three years to write Run. You know, it took us under a year to write the system of 50 minutes. It's a learning curve. We didn't go to university to study script. You know, so, you know, we're learning. And uh, we're just, we're I think we need to grow to We've definitely learned on the job and haven't learned, uh, you know, read a lot of books about it. It's, you know, it's, it's come from giving it a crack. Okay, well let's go to the, uh, the end of the development process. How do you know where to stop? How did you know it was ready? Because there was a deadline. <laughs> we were up. <laughs> Louis, so I remember uh, getting up in the middle of the night to read something that Louis had written at maybe two or three in the morning that we needed to hand him the next day. Uh, because I kind of had a eureka moment. But Louis was still going till six in the morning or something in the final. That's the good thing about having um, producers on at the tail of the process where they give you deadlines and you can't miss them.
and uh, you know, I think that was good for us. Thank you. Yeah. That line of question didn't go anywhere. No. <laughs> so, um, actually, producer, producer, one on producers. Um, what um, you've been through? You've been through a process with a feature. What do you What do you look for in a producer now? Um, or don't look for. I I think the key thing to a producer. Um, and, and a producer such as, you know, as a, probably heard an open-ended term, you know, um, some are great with money, some are great with budgets and relationships and putting up great deals, and others are, are pretty strong creatively, um, and uh, some are great at selling, you know, and moving it in the market. Um, and, and if you're really lucky, so you get the one that can do all of that, I think their name's God. But, you know, you, it's, a it's, really, a, it's a really big job this week. It's, it's, it's funny how many people outside the industry go, oh, what's a producer? And, I, and often I go, hang on, I scratch my head and go, well, you know, and when you write, and when you sort of list their job description, they've got a tough one, you know? Like, uh, on the one hand, they need to be sensitive to creative ideas, they need to be able to sort of work a team, mm -hmm. you know, people, and all of the personalities that go into that. Uh, you know, they need to be able to meet, you know, put pressure on us to meet deadlines and stuff like that. And um, so, it's, geez, it's a hard job. But um, to, to answer your question, I think, you know, one of the first things I think that you need to have from a producer is that they need to love your work. It's hard if, you, if you're just starting out, but, um, you know, where, where, where we're at at the moment, you know, if, if we, you know, looking, if we were to look for a producer, we would be um, asking, you know, firstly they'd need to be coming to us and going, shit, we love your stuff, you know, like, yeah. we've seen shopping, we love it, we love the six dollar fifty man, we love rum, you know, how do you, how do you guys do it? And that's the most important question of all from a producer to a, to a creative is, how do you guys work? It's you know? process, yeah. How do you work? And that's, the, the and, and it's in most things too, I think the people that ask questions are the ones that sort of want to understand how you gonna kind of work together? Yeah. So why? Why? Just tell me a bit more about that. Why is it the most important question? How do you work? Well, <clears throat> that's where the money goes. Essentially, it's based on their understanding of what you believe as a as a as a director or writer director. Um, what what process you need to undertake um, at the different stages of production, pre-production, etc. Um, you know, that, it's that, what's that? Which they're supporting. That's what the money is there for. So if we you know, if they walk in with a blueprint and they go, this is the model, and I've done this before, um, mm -hmm. and they don't sit there and actually inquire as to how you work, um, because it's just money, you know, and money can be moved around, deals can be pulled, and, yeah. and it's you know it's a it's a moving it's a moving massive of digits, and you know if they don't take that on board, you will never really be able to achieve. Well, you might. You know, and there's always the challenge, you know, there's always that. Right. But you won't be able to, able to achieve, you know, your vision as completely, you know, as ideally as, as you want to. And that's okay sometimes. In fact, that's what happens most of the time. But the more they're open to that, the more they're going to be able to put the money in the right place. And save money, actually. Like, I think, you know, I mean, we've, we've done commercials and stuff like that, and the smartest producers are the ones that go, okay, what do you want to do? Drug treatment, you go, okay, cool. Well, you know, the, the producer will be going, well, that's, that creative idea's got a lot of art department in it. You know, uh, less camera work. They don't, they don't take the budget from the last job and try to rubber stamp it onto the next one. They look at the vision first, you know, and then the, when there's, uh, you know, if, 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 uh, if the blocks aren't all coming together and adding up to the number that they had in their head, all the the budget that they have, then we need to make some really hard creative decisions. And we're part of that budgeting process because we go, okay, cool, well, we understand that we can't do that. Maybe we need less in the camera department and more in the art department, for instance. You know, if we're doing a drama that's set in a submerged swimming pool, for instance, you know, you kind of, <laughs> you know, there's going to be different costs to, you know, the types of films and kind of that we make that, you know, that's sort of more reality. Let's go forward into the making of it. Um, you know, co-directors. I'm trying to think of other co-directors in New Zealand. Are there other directing teams? Yeah, Thomas Robbins and David Stubbs. Okay. Or television. Yeah, yeah. television. Yeah. Uh, television and, 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 and,
I mean, if we, if we, one of us walked onto a set, onto your set, what would we see? See you guys doing? Oh. <laughs> He's usually on PlayStation or something. Yeah, yeah. Are we? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, I don't know. It's funny, eh? Because it all depends. Yeah, it depends on what we're shooting, Andrew. Um, no, it's. <laughs> It, it's, it, we're pretty relaxed. We like to be pretty relaxed, and we like a relaxed set. Okay, I'm going to give you specific questions to help me along there, okay? <laughs> so, um, you walk on the set, how do you decide the shots? Uh, it all, that, again, that depends on um, different scenes. So, for instance, in shopping, <laughs> well, no, in shopping, um, we, we were going for a very kind of organic approach to the way that we would approach scenes, which is quite different to how we did before, where I kind of work up the storyboard, Louis and I would discuss it at length, you know, before we arrived on set, we'd have kind of a clear plan in our heads. Um, whereas in, our sh in shopping, you know, to begin with, we started kind of really loose on our, on our shop plan. We had ideas in our heads, uh, but they weren't boarded as much as if we were little stick figures on a page. Um, as the process went on, we sort of realised that to communicate properly, we kind of actually, you know, I need to until one in the morning, sort of drawing shot lists and learning to, to sort of focus on how we were going to get the cast up for the next day, and that was the way that it worked best for us, you know. But everyone's different. Uh, so, on set, generally, um, you know, we would have talked at length about cinematography together, and then we would, I would convey that to the DOP, and Louis traditionally would, would sort of talk more to the cast. It's just more efficient. Um, so if there was a, if there, one of the actors needed help with a performance, that that would be Louis. You'd, you'd step up and talk to them about that. Generally speaking, but I mean, <coughs> we <coughs> mm. <coughs> it's always a um, it's always one of those questions where you know, as you can see, we're going, oh, geez, you know, because we're we're delineating all of a sudden. Um, we generally don't. We try not to. Um, the big aim is to know exactly what we're doing before we step onto set. Um, and then, although one of us is speaking in whatever role, um, we're speaking for each other. That's a that's a collaboration. Is that you know, it's the one voice. Because as soon as you get on set, and look, you know, if, if Louis and I start going, that's not what I thought, and you go, that's not what I thought, then kind of you get into a little bit of trouble. Or, and particularly when you you all street, you try to cram, you know, particularly with the model in this country, which is a very short preprint. You know, like I keep saying to everyone. Uh, you know, in our shorts, we had like two weeks pre-production for a short and a week shooting. You know, uh, the idea was, that, or, you know, the model that was used on shopping was that we would have two weeks pre-production for for a six-week shoot, and that sort of gives you an idea of kind of what you have to cram in the last few weeks with the cast and everything. So it's kind of um, it's a lot more stressful, and if you turn up on set. Um, as tired and stressed as kind of you tend to get on a first time feature and stuff like that, it's kind of productive having not done your homework before you get on there. So we go street casting to get the, the characters, the personalities that's, that are the characters. Uh, we use theatre sports uh, more than anything, a little tricks and games to sort of see how they make um, decisions, their instincts, the personage, and we cast there. Um, and above all, confidence and intelligence, and then we get them, and then we um, we, we start to build them up, and you know, it's, it's little things. Eh? It's like we never got, I never got this, you know, we never got the script down. You know, we just you didn't get the script down. Not until really late. Yeah, no, it's, it's just a, it, it becomes an anchor, and it, and it becomes an 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 ambition. The script because it's so two dimensional and, and limited. Whereas if you if you keep it open, like we'd write scripts or a scene that had a similar tone or shape uh, for the actors the night before and get them learning that. And what we're doing is giving them an understanding of the, the emotional requirement for them and testing their skills, their ability to, you know, basic skills, uh, blocking, you know, learning lines and shit like that. Um, so they were, they were used to running the run, but they, they didn't know the marathon at that stage because they become bored very quickly. We become bored very quickly. You know, a nine-year-old kid's going to become bored very quickly. Um, and then we just threw them together. We hardly got them to act until very late in the piece. We just had them mucking around. A lot of a lot of a lot of Kiwi directors are onto this. Yeah, you know, it's more about actually creating a relationship, not even the pretense of one. Um, so we just got them hanging out. And I got really tight with the older kid who stayed with us for a month, uh, Kevin, 
And what we just pretty much said to him as director was we'd seen them out together and he, you bodyguard him, that's yours, you know. And he, and he was like, he's great, he's a great kid, he's intelligent, all of that. And so, the, you know, instantly, the, you know, Julian, the young kid, looks up to him and he has, he has an older brother. By the time we're rolling, the relationship's there, you know, we're just drizzling words, so. So how, when exactly did they get the script? Did they? Did you give them a whole Sometimes script? They didn't. Like for you know, like the scenes they were watching out there, there was uh, we'd written the script, but really we just sort of said to them, okay, well, we're going to have a play fight now. <laughs> so we we just let them play, and we you know, um, and we rolled on a lot of the stuff that you saw on the screen there. Um, you know, certain stuff that they. There's, that is scripted, that's kind of more, you know, stri you know it's, it's strict in terms of, you know, like when they sink under the pool and, and watch, watch the girl getting groped under the water, that sort of stuff. But, you know, all, all of the playing things, you know, I think you need to be brave on set, like we were talking about it earlier, but, you know, uh, it's really hard when there's sort of the day's pressure and everything like that, and you sort of roll on stuff that is, there is, a, you know, where there's play and some stuff that's up there. Also, we didn't know whether it was going to be in the film or not, mm. uh, but we rolled on it. Stuff like... We, we'd sit there, right? Sometimes we'd sit there and we'd go, this is dead in the ass, man. This is terrible. And we'd go, shit. And so me and Mark would sit together and we'd And we'd jump up and we'd approach our first AD and we'd go, Joe, this is what we need. Give us a minute. And then we'd think of a game and then we'd get the kids to play a game, yeah. like at the dishes once, because it was just... It was like a church ceremony. <laughs> Uh, we created a little game just using the map of the water and the dishes and, and this was the goal and all of a sudden there was life and it was like kids and they weren't like, you know, it's that typical game, you know, they weren't acting anything out, it was fresh to them but they were really versing each other and things were happening in front of us and we were just really open to stuff like that when it feels a little bit weighty or, or, or you know, in the script we knew we needed life there so we'll pre-plan it so we can throw something fresh at them and, and uh, everyone's ready to hopefully capture the gold, you know? Yeah, we really like uh, when the cast bring their own language mm. and things, you know, to the, to the film. You know, the, that's, you know, that's the way they speak, that's the way they are. Um, Did you script the story that he was telling there? No. No, we came up with it in a workshop. And it, it was um, our, our DA, uh, Liam Butler, actually was looking after them. We created a real strong relationship there. <clears throat> and he came up one day to us and he said, oh, you know, he's got this story. And so we recorded it. It was weird, we recorded it and um, at the time on a, a little mic and the mic wasn't working properly. And um, he, he pretty much, he hadn't read the script, but he weirdly, he, he created this and he was just talking like in an interview with uh, Julian, his name was, he was nine at the time. He pretty much described the story, but in a nine-year-old's perspective, in a robot world with the witch, you know, there was all this shit going on, and we were like, God, this is gold. <laughs> so we got it all in really bad sound bites, and, and funnily enough, we tried, to, we, tried, yeah, we tried to recreate it later, but we couldn't, you know, because he, after we'd shot filming, we'd been in post with, um, you know, uh, Annie Collins for a long period of time, we tried to bring it back to it, and it was, he was alien to it, so we ended up jogging them, and it wasn't him anymore, it was yeah. us sitting there puppeting. So the, the stuff that we had recorded, uh, you know, while we were, we were mucking around with Julia, uh, when we were trying to find, you know, workshop scenes and stuff like that, made it into the final film. It was a shot on a, a little TV camera. We were sort of mucking around, and that, luckily, you know, obviously, um, you know, the, the voiceover in the film, <clears throat> which you haven't seen here, uh, he's sort of, he's jamming on, on set there, but earlier there's, uh, he, he records his story on a, on a cassette player, so we got away with the inadequacy of sound because it felt more and real, like, like a kid tape. was actually recording yeah. onto a tape. So, uh, but yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great dimension to the film, and in fact, you know, some of his drawings and sketches and things like that sort of inspired the topography for the film as well. So, so here we are in post-production now. Did you get the story there that you wrote, or...? No, we hardly ever do. <coughs> it comes with trying to create all the time through it. And, um, firstly, we, we make a choice of trying to find stuff, and if we find stuff, like, like Mike was just talking about, we'll, we'll go with it, and we'll have that in mind. Um, when we edit, it's much like writing, Mark likens it to writing. Um, 
because because you're back to kind of itching it out again, you know, and the, the, the evidence you put a paper and the footage is the, the other words and you know, and, and, and the script's nothing more than an idea all of a sudden, and now you've got something physical so you can you can play around with it. A lot of directors do that. I think it's really brave. We we enjoy it. There's a lot of arguing, um, a lot of fighting. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, you, you find some stuff that you could never write. It's a bit like improv and finding good stuff with actors. They, they give you lines, they create stuff you could never write. We tried a lot of yeah. stuff, we, we shot a lot of stuff that was never in the script. Um, you know, it was a B-roll stuff that made it to the film. Yeah. Um, you know, there are scenes, you know, where we cut back to what's happening at home that were never in the script. And they're so, you know, some of those are my, you know, our favourite moments in the film that sort of give a weight of gravity. Um, you know, when Willie's part of the film where Willie's out partying and we cut back to mum and she's just waiting by the phone, for instance. Well, that mum waiting by the phone was never there, you know? And so our catch cry on the whole film was like, shit, just be brave. That really annoys producers too. <laughs> no, we're, we're, you know, we, we know that uh, it's demanding, we're demanding our process, you know. We're, we're not going to change it. We just need to find a producer strong enough to, to, <laughs> to, to go along with it. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm conscious that we're at a script to screen event and there's probably a lot of writers in the room. Um, how do you help um, explain the role of the script in a process where, as you said, the script just became a bit of paper and you're actually making a... Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Well, I think, yeah. you know, it's just that to balance that, we also think that the script's the most important thing yeah. in the entire process of making a film, you don't start with a good script, you're, you're a bit shagged. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, this, you know, it's like, people tell you this all the time, but it's like building a house without any foundation. You know, we had that foundation, so we kind of knew where we could play. But if we didn't have a solid script beforehand. Uh, yeah, and just to be clear, it's not like we go, you know what, I've had a genius moment. The boy's a girl. So let's just, I know we've been shooting for a week, but you know, it's not like we baby bath water it. We get, we get what we write. Um, we always get what we write. We so just try to do it economically and do it well enough so we can quickly enough so that we can then start to search and find stuff. So the script's kind of like a, yeah, it's like a document of intention, yeah. I suppose. Uh, it gives you an idea of the shape of the film, but doesn't give you all the answers, you know? And I think, yeah, yeah some people work differently, but. We would it, would, on this would it be fair to say that you you know you're improvising, you're capturing stuff that it wasn't in the script, but you the criteria you use to work out whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, that's because of the truth of the script. Well, we knew what each scene needed to do because we should we stuck up little bits of paper for months <laughs> and worked out you know when we were in the red zone and the green zone or whatever or you know we where our arcs and shape. We're, this is a traditional narrative, you know. You've got to, if you don't have a script, you're it's also like, you know, you, you write something that's in your head, you cast it, you get people to enact it um, and be themselves and, and offer stuff up. You, you generally, um, I think even with, you know, great directors or performers or whatever, you, you end up with something slightly different that feels different. So, you know, all of a sudden, you know, the idea that, say, the father would be empathetic or, well, you know, he's laughing too much and he comes across actually, as opposed to empathetic and, di you know, dimensional. He's sounding a little mad, you know, so what are we going to do? And, you know, we talk, we discuss, the producers come in, we do, we look at it as a group. That's really, a group's really good, because um, everyone kind of forms an audience and, and you You're know... talking post. Yeah, we're talking in post. And so then all of a sudden, you know, what was an idea, what was sitting well in the script, it's on the floor, and Dad becomes a very different beast in the film because it works better for what we've got in the cut. And the, that's interesting because the journey of the cut is a lot like the journey of writing a film, where you get to the first cut of your film and you go, oh my god, what have we made? You know, and when you get to the end of the first script, generally you go, oh my god, what, what have I written? You know, so from there you start pulling and weeding and reshaping and it's a, it's a whole other process. But it is, it is similar, you know? Yeah. Because often, you know, you work on stuff on set that's gold and you, you know that it works, but then you, there's a lot of stuff that you work on on set that, didn't, that doesn't work as well as it might have, or you thought it might be more dramatic than it actually was, or, you know, whatever. So you, you've got to, you know, using the shape of the script, you know that this scene has to have a, have a certain weight to it, and if, it, if it's not working there, then you need to wait, pull it from somewhere else. I just hate, <coughs> we haven't done this, hey? 
but I'd hate to add up all the scenes and all the change that we've left on the floor and then write out how much that's worth because that would be too long. <laughs> <laughs> Give that back to the film commission. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I might just stick up for us here though and say we were, for the whole, for the whole film though, I mean we shot it in six weeks, which you know some directors in this room were telling us seven weeks minimum and we went 40 minutes over. What was the ratio that you shot? 17 to 1. Was it 17? That's not very much. That's not very much. So, yeah, I think one thing we did learn from um, our short, sorry I don't want to keep talking about the shooting process because I'm aware that everyone's here to talk about writing, but uh, we're mostly writers, but, you know, there was scenes that we picked in, like, for instance, $6.50 Man, where we improv stuff, and we kind of, it was really interesting how much you learn uh, very quickly, how much you can sort of get away with and not get away with, with, with improv, and there's certain scenes that sort of allow you to do that, and some that don't. Well, I'd love to follow that, but I'm not going to follow that. We're going to run out of time. <laughs> La last, last question. Um, you, you're out in the world now. You, you've, you've, you take, you've got a domestic release here, May 30, uh, but it's gone to a number of festivals. What's that been like? What's that been like? The American audiences, European audiences? Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, the, the, we went to um, Sundance. We premiered at Sundance, and then we went to Berlin. And, and it was worlds apart, and, you know, um, I think the biggest thing about uh, the difference between um, those two festivals is we had the um, subtitles in Germany for the 14 plus year old kids, you know, that were part in of English. the English. And we had, had it in English, of course, in Spanish. And, <laughs> and, uh, and, and of course, they needed it, because they're, they're bright over there, but, you know, English is still the second language, even though the average German speaks about three or four languages. We're going to catch up to But the, the thing is, in the States, we did it because we had this, so it was a creative, creative decision to some degree where we went, ah, oh, you know, um, they'll, they'll understand the English. And if they don't get certain aspects, um, or one decision we made, there was some Polish and some Samoan, we won't subtitle that. That's gone. I was got subtitled in Germany, um, in Berlin, and uh, we also made a decision not to subtitle any, any of the English, and, and particularly for characters like the mother figure who's sub, full Samoan when she's speaking English, such a strong accent. Um, yeah, I can remember when we were younger, and Mark would come around, and, and my mum would talk, and I'd be going, yeah, 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 sure, yeah. And we'd walk out, and Mark would be nothing like this. I walk outside and I go, what did you just say? <laughs> you know, um, and I wish I remembered that, you know, when we made some of these decisions, but I think the result was in the States that they really had an issue with accents. And it's not, you know, it, and I think it's a really important thing for Kiwis to remember, particularly Kiwis, is they do have an issue uh, whether you're Pākehā, Māori or Samoan, they even find, you know, they find a southern twang really hard, you know, from Laura. They would, you wouldn't think so, but they do, they find it. And, and so they're, they're dropping off beats. They're not getting it. And uh, we also, this up quite early. There's a range of theatres that your movie plays in. Like for instance, we, we, uh, we got all G'd up because we were playing in the coolest theatre in Sundance. We got in there in our film play that was the worst screening technically of our film that I think we've seen, you know, anywhere since. It was the, you know, the, Egypt, it, the Egyptian theatre, the which was a lot, wasn't too much fancier than this room, but it's kind of like, you know, boutique. They had this like uh, this uh, agent hey, from uh, was it Jay going, my God, you guys got the you guys got the Egyptian, my God, you know. And, <laughs> and we got there, and then it was like a fucking transistor radio <laughs> in the front on the left hand side. I couldn't and understand. Old I couldn't understand. Yeah. And, and, it was, and so now there's all these freaking uh, you know people uh, sort of writing for magazines, you know. They're kind of like, and it's the coldest audience you'll ever go to is one where you've got industry people, right, you know, so people writing magazines and other people wanting to buy your film. They all sit in there like this. They're going to check in the time for the next screening, stuff like that. Apparently, you know, if you've done pretty well if half the yeah. theatre don't walk out. I think we had so we, like 10. That was our premiere like. screening and we were like, you know, it but was, it, it was, it was, uh, and, it was a toughie. And not to slam the Americans, it's a, cult, it's a cultural thing, you know, it's something we need to wake up to and address in some way or form. If, in retrospect, I go, fuck, there's subtitle everything, you know, <laughs> subtitle everything. Yeah. Some we don't care, we have, uh, we have some <laughs> animation running <laughs> underneath. <laughs> I was actually thinking of learning sign, so I guess that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I was, and, and, but, 
But you know, because Boyhead, uh, Tyke had the same thing with yeah. Boy, we talk about yeah. him exactly the same thing. <laughs> you know, and, and if they're missing beats, as we all know, if they're missing the story, they're not going to get the emotion. Gotta go dialogue free, dialogue free. Well, yeah, yeah. picture myself or something. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, but in Berlin, poor, you know, doing that. Yeah, they, they got it, and it was so nice to sit there. Well, not, not to say that people didn't get it in the States, but just a general feel of how we could have critiqued, you know, got it better, which is really important. Whereas in Germany we had teenagers wolf whistling, we thought they were taking the piss to start with, you know, and uh, but they, they loved it, they got it, you know, and so that was that was really interesting. Um, but you know, and there was there was this thing too where they went and one of the, the, the reviews, <coughs> I think it was the Hollywood Report, he goes, you know, it would have been nice if uh, if if they'd, you know, a bit more of the backstory to the political time and a bit more of this and a bit more of that. But you know, we made a decision creatively. This is this is a Kiwi film. It's for New Zealanders. We're not going to tell New Zealanders what they already know and bore the hell out of them. We're going to concentrate on the drama. If you've got questions, fucking Google it. <laughs> <laughs> is that kind of approach? And, and like, you know, we'll, we'll we're not here to give Americans history lessons. They can, <laughs> they can check out our history. Sorry, we're doing about slow versus culture. Nothing wrong with that. I didn't know what the CIA was when I was like nine and watching all of those TV shows, but I kind of figured it out relatively quickly. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah, so so it was a it was a creative decision, things like that. And they found that hard, but you know. So. But one thing, you know, like watching with an audience is so good as a director, and I imagine it would be really good as a writer, you know, just to see what works. And I would encourage. I I, I think I can remember, you know, I've, I've met some filmmakers that go, well, mate, when the movie starts playing, I'm out of there. Different filmmakers, but shit, you learn so much by sitting through yeah. with different crowds. Um, you know, really interesting watching with a Polynesian audience our film. You know, as opposed to German kids. Yeah. And seeing did, did you test screen? Did you test, do test screenings? No, oh, I wish we had. We <laughs> did. No, no, we did. We well, did put some early cuts yeah. and things, and we made some decisions based on sort of some preliminary. It was more of a um, It was more of a test on on the on the cut. <clears throat> and what people were and, and, and were getting, as opposed to testing the audience, you know, who does it appeal to? Because we're kind of at that stage now. So, yeah. Yeah. so we didn't do demographic screenings, we, did, um, we did screenings where we got a lot of people together, and you know, as much as we could, not film people, general audience type people, and then we got them to ask us questions, and we asked specific questions of whether, of whether they were getting sort of certain beats. Um, so it was more of a, you know, do you get the story type screenings and making sure that it's clear. Okay, well look, we, we're going to run out of time, but um, I know that um, that Esther wanted to leave some time here for um, questions from the floor, so you want to ask these guys something, now's your time. Now's your time. I see a hand shut up at the back there. Do you, Esther, do you want a microphone to go out? Or, or oh, no, no, right. Just st stand up and yell loud, please. All right, sweet. Um, I just wanted to wonder if you guys would be happy talking about the documents you write for a feature, the documents you write before the script, e.g. the treatment, how detailed it is. Do you go from there to a scene breakdown, or do you go straight from the treatment to the script? Uh, it's the, well, it's different. both of our films, with, even, yeah, two feature films have started in different ways as per our short films, mm. but mostly because shit, when, we, when we did well with our shorts, um, you know, as you kind of do, you get a bit of attention, and, and, and we pretty much got uh, money to start writing our feature based on was it the synopsis. I don't even know if they look at the synopsis, but said, "Go ahead, boys, make you, you know write write your film, get stuck in." You know, we came back with the first draft. Um, whereas on the um, you know, so you actually wrote, so you wrote a draft. You didn't go through those steps. And didn't, no, I didn't write a treatment. We uh, we were lucky where we sort of I suppose we got to see funding to write our film. Quite, um, sort of we're quite based big on our on, success. We're quite, we're, quite, we're quite big on going, um, you know, uh, finding out where we need to go by, by talking about where we're at and, and feeling it out. Um, you know, um, each, each project, and we've got another couple um, which, which we're I'm building kind of props for at the moment and, and having a look at them in a wider perspective. 
but, but all of them are really different. They're you know? all different. Like, um, yeah, you're talking more sort of official would, documents. Like, would you use cards? index cards or something? Like, how would you move? Do you just draft or do you? No, oh, it's sorry, sorry, no, 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 no. Yeah. So yeah. we, we, we do. Talk about, uh, you talk about treatments throughout. Yeah. yeah. What does that look? What does a treatment look like to you? Well, it's really interesting because we wrote our first treatment for the film for the one that I'm writing at the moment, Hell's Teeth. Well, the one that I'm, you know, Louis feeding into and I'm writing. But um, it was a 25-page, basically, plot outline or a plot summary of the entire film. Uh, 25 pages. Yeah. Which is really interesting because I went from writing the script, we just, you know, a mountain of detail in every scene, and then you know, go to um, the treatment, which, man, you just got to be really uh, focused on. Yeah. What you put on it, which is which is good. Yeah, we we're talking about the treatment late last night. Do we do a show in cover page? If we go with the visual uh, context, we should have it on every page. You know, we you know we we're just bouncing and trying to find it um, and do the right thing for the for the project with the mic who's going to read it. You know, um, and how it feels and words. Like I I felt the treatment was really strong. The one we've got at the moment with Mark very strong the text. Uh, it felt like we needed. Uh, visuals, but Mark wanted to, to approach that today, so we go with that, and we kind of yeah, we kind of really just just work our way through it. We use yeah, we use cards, and we'll go for drafts, two or three drafts without cards. It just really depends on where we feel we are so, in that. Yeah, cards are really useful um, in terms of looking at your story arc and stuff like that. Where, so when you're talking about red and green before you're talking about having red and green, is that, that actually prior to shoot, that pre-production for shoot was that the script? Uh, no, both. it was it was both, yeah. So like the change it on character arcs, we just thought I don't know whether this is done, but we just kind of went, what? Oh, fuck, I'm losing this, and uh, I know. And then let's just put all of Nicole and his da -da -da relationships in pink, and when Charlie appears, we'll go blue, and you could just sort of see who was suffering, you know. Um, and so yeah, then maybe need a little bit more kind of time on the screen. Yeah, you know, you want to go beige, you know. But it is amazing. Aubergine it is, is, it is amazing. Yeah. Yeah, every device that you use like that is it's all about sort of getting clarity and how to step back. But then we went tonally, you know, when we came closer to like in pre-production, we were looking more visually at it, how it should feel, and coverage, and and and, and, and costume, and we went to um, you know the the tone of each scene. So, you know, blue was sad and red was anger and, you know, and then we could kind of see the emotional journey of it and we thought that was a good idea and stuff like that, you know, and it's just, there's no rules. Changing the colour for every, you know, for, so you have a beat, a scene breakdown and changing the colour for what's your first act, your second act and your third act. You could see really quickly that you've got a massive first act, you know, or, a, you know, a long third act or whatever. But that's okay, we left out of the category. Great answer, great answer. <laughs> Anybody else? So, yeah, go. Yeah, 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 right. So, uh, Fuck, you've got notes. <laughs> New, <laughs> yeah, New, New Zealand's really like, open to the child perspective, obviously, with you know, Wild Ride Boy, all of these like, really topical kind of uh, productions we've been through the eyes of a child. Um, and I noticed that through even your guys' films, you're, you're very much based in there, and I know that you were saying that it's because of your. Like obviously you're writing from what you know and in your history and all of that, but is it that you're I mean attracted to it because kids can play and adults are so conditioned, or do you do you I mean have you had there's, a there's no rules to it, man. If, you know, like if I'd seen my granddad, but you know, I was um, yeah. If 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 we could be a uh, film could have been about an old person, older person that sort of inspires a story. Uh, for us, you know, and that might be the central sort of and, and would character. You have, but would you have attacked it the same way that you did with the playing aspect? You know, what I, what I was trying to figure out is the sort, you know, how you let the kids kind of run free in their own imagination because mm. they're so imaginative, mm. but yet, you know, we're so conditioned as adults to sort of preconceive mm. ideas. Did you do you find that adults still can play? I think our job is to try. Yeah, it, yeah. it depends on what's required in the scene, the weight of the scene, the journey of the scene, the character that you're playing, the age, you know. It, it really is case by case, but you know we're required. Um, if you're asking whether an actor should be able to play a shit, yeah, that's the job. Yeah. And I think the older you get, maybe uh, you know, just traditionally, I think you know, older, older cast members have sort of come through and doing, doing done a lot of uh, you know plays and stuff like that, where it's you know fairly formal. So to break out of that, I think you know, it's a little bit harder. So let's um, ask you about Alistair Browning, who plays the father. He's a very experienced actor. I remember him on the theatre stage of Court Theatre in Christchurch when I was growing up, so I know that he's formally trained. 
Um, <coughs> so, did you give him a script? Uh, yes. And how did how did so? And we we held that off again. We held that off for a very long time. I think um, Alistair. Um, I, I made a decision earlier on with Alistair that he had some great texture that uh, was kindred to the character, but that his craft and he comes from a theatre background, he would dissect and thrash that script and turn it upside down before we had a chance to have him in the workshop. So we protected him from himself. And that's okay, you know, I mean, that does respect that. We talked, we talked to him about that and, and said, look, this is the way we have to work. You know, and he's desperate to get the answers, but sometimes it's better having someone with questions on the floor. And, and sometimes it's good with him walking into the room on set, uh, being imbalanced and not solid, you know, so you can, you can use that. And it's the job of the director to know the actors and, and how they work, their craft, and you, can um, you know, the, the process, sorry, the process yeah. they use, what, whatever that is. It, it's your job to work out the math real fast and the actors are quick, you know, and, and be able to, you know, something like if we need someone like a loaded gun to walk into the room, then that would be great. You know, it's like read it early, we'll load you up on the day. But if you're looking for texture or something else and it requires you know, some softness or, you know, a certain uh, sensibility, then, then you need to know who you're working with, know the process, and find a way of getting to that. Sometimes that's, that's a, a little bit of head games. You know? Yeah, and I think you need to be aware of that when you're casting. And it's, it is really interesting, like when you are casting, you can see characters that, um, you know, or people that come in and they've read the script a million times and it's really interesting because when, uh, when you ask them to change something, they can't. Yeah. It's <coughs> a little bit softer, but they've read it a hundred times, like this way, and they just, they just can't. It's, it's really hard because almost, you know, that if, if you change the process for them on the way in, that maybe, you know, things could be a little bit different, or maybe they're just not built the way, that way, and that's not how they approach things. I think that, that requires a bit of trust, too, between the director and the actor, particularly from the actor toward the director. And it's a risk, you know, you know you, that what I thought when I saw the film was that you'd brought a classically trained actor into the kids' improvisational arena, mm. you know, so... Yeah. Yeah. And he did it's it, I think he did it. Risk. I think well, oh, yeah. amazing. Well it's you know, it's it is a, it is a, it's three hundred, three and a half sorry, three and a half million dollars on the table. It's always gonna be a big risk, you know. Mm -hmm. Um but I think Alistair it's one of Alistair's best performances um in the in the film I thought he came it was a little bit of raging ball yeah. and yeah, yeah, right. He he stands out. Anyway, that's close to home. Anybody else? <laughs> that you. Yeah. Hey, just about your writing processes. You said that um you know, one would write and the other would feed it. Is that kind of how you guys worked best together? So one would have an idea, go away and write, bring it back, the other would then feed it through that and work. How does your writing process begin? I think early on, um, the best thing you can do is leave someone in a room and let them find their story. If it's, if that, if, if, if it's there, if that hold on, hold on, well, the way that we work is that if one does is hold on a story, then we'll leave the other alone to kind of write it and get their ideas down without getting messed up by early feedback. Because um, that's the last thing you want is people to start shooting before you kind of, kind of re you know, shooting with feedback before you're ready. Because kind of haven't, you, you know it's all wrong because you haven't, hang on, I just haven't got it down how I want it yet. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when I sort of said before um, that, the, you know, the, the treatment felt like it was getting to, uh, you know, so far the writing's felt really nice, it's because I've been allowed that sort of space and time, and now, now that Louis sort of feeding into it, um, you know, he's more informed on his feedback and stuff like that, and it sort of, you know, it, it makes more sense and you don't get all guarded, because, of, because you're at a stage where you're ready, and if that and, makes sense. And there's lots of good stuff that comes later, like, um, Initially, you know, even though we were mentioning <coughs> before about the process we took with uh, the first couple few drafts of shopping, is that there were just shitloads of scenes that we left on the floor. Well, funnily enough, you know, um, all those scenes, it's the wrong way, whatever. Um, after all that searching, you know, we ended up as we got closer towards the tail, Mark would be in the, LB would be in the room with me, and this is the deadline time, and we're like, Jesus. And I'm literally passing scenes across the table, sending by the email. And the fuck is that one? And, and, and at the same time, he's feeding back. Um, and then there might be the requirement for another scene. You know, so I mean, straight away, the relationship is in the same room all of a sudden. 
and it's very finite, it's almost like he's editing his own writing. But then at the same time, we've got all of those scenes, and so many times it was like, you know, without the exploring, we wouldn't have, would have had this option. It was like, Jesus, we need this kind of scene, and we need this to happen, and we need this, you know, because we'd be problem solving. And it'd be, oh, right, yeah, no, let me just go back to draft 2.9. You know, we'd pull it out, and there'd be three or four scenes we could choose from. So it was really, that exploring is really important, not only for the writer to be able to find yes. their voice and, and find the world of the film, because you can always cut away, but you can't always create, once you start honing things down. But those options were always there, you know. Yeah. It's like a marriage. Kind of, yeah. And like a marriage, sometimes it don't work. When, when doesn't it work? Oh, I, I think we say this to everyone, like, because you always make mistakes. There's lots of things that don't work. You know, that's just life, yeah. you know. But you've got to learn from those things and then get around them somehow. Yeah. And if you can't, you know, like, when, when you get past them, you know not to go back there because you're going to have to say, you know, it's going to take you longer to get around the hill. <laughs> no, but, uh, yeah. I have this analogy I said it here last time, it still stands true. So, so, and it was like, um, I can't drive a kilometre up the road in the family van without Daphne, my fiance, telling me that I fucked up. <laughs> How are we going to create a film over six years, a feature film, without one of us getting it wrong, or the other one telling that something shit? You know, it's just the way it works. Accept it and move on. Is that <laughs> philosophy? Yeah, there's the, you know, there's the two different two egos in the room. You know, there's, the, there's no such thing as a person with no ego, for sure. You know, and sometimes your pride gets hurt. And, you know, you have a little bit of a. Yeah, periods where you don't talk. You know, and you know, is there? A, well, I've a, a half a day once. <laughs> it's a half day once. You need your space safe eh, from time to time. Yeah. Otherwise, you go crazy. It's, it's like in your relationship where you can't. And and to be honest, say the last uh, the last part of the journey is the hardest when you do actually start getting in the room. And it starts getting, you know, you start, running. even when I was feeding into the last script, you know, I started getting, I, I, uh, towards the end, I just couldn't read the script anymore without falling asleep. And uh, that's what happens, mate. You read it so many times, over and over and over. And one word of advice would be that, you know, if you are the left hand to the right, that you should really, really, really be careful about how many times you read the script. And every time you read the script, it's kind of like gold because, uh, you know, you start seeing, start seeing things and, you know, it's impossible to give feedback if you're, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're snowblind, yeah, it's like watching a movie a hundred times and you become, you know, desens desensitised to it, so, yeah. Okay, I think we're rolling to a halt here, yeah. These guys have been amazingly generous, I think, so. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you to the New Zealand Film Commission who continue to support us to put on these kind of um, events and do everything we do and to the ASB Community Trust. And thank you to Heritage Hotels who have put these guys up. Um, uh, please stay and have a slice of pizza with us. Also, there's a survey on your tables about the writer's room generally, what you feel about it. Um, it's really good to know who you are, whether you're a writer, director, producer, what stage you're at, so please do fill it out for us, we'd really appreciate it. It makes it um, good for our planning and it also helps us to keep getting the money we need to do what we do, so thank you. Um, finally, can I say again, uh, well thank you very much to Andrew, thanks so much Andrew, and also to Mark and Louis for being so generous, for coming up from Wellington after what I'm sure has been a really exhausting couple of years. Um, so yeah, thanks very much guys, we appreciate it a lot. I, I just wanted to say one thing before we uh, round it off actually, is that you know, although Louis and I, uh, you know, we, we have so far written you know, a lot of our, our own stuff, we are kind of interested in collaborating with writers, I mean I just don't want people to think that we're, you know, live in a bubble. It's an open um, marriage, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well no, you know, like I think we, I don't think we know, you know, we like doing things uh, in new and refreshing ways all the time. So, you know, the value of a scriptwriter, we, we definitely don't want to, you know, I think scriptwriting is just so important and that you guys um, need to keep doing what you're doing.